you know, so when we talk about being in relationship with nature, that is the new story. And when we talk about that humans aren't the supreme intelligent beings or the, the beings in charge of control of all of earth, that's also part of that story. You know, it's, it's about coming back into alignment with nature, being part one aspect of nature and working together with all of nature to create the world. And, and in that is also remembering ourselves and remembering our full potential because we we don't even recognize it again you know when i mentioned earlier about beauty like that's only one aspect that's been culturated into us so so many things we've been cultured that we're not this or we are this or that we don't even really know who we are and but again working with the plants it's one way that they help us to see our wholeness and and who we truly are and that's part of that new story is like is working together, including with one another, you know, that it is together that we thrive. It's there's this competition, this hierarchy stuff, it all has to get yeah. tossed out. It doesn't work. And, right. and we're going to end up destroying ourselves if we continue down that road. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, in humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by author Jen Fry to discuss her book, Communicating with Plants, Heart-Based Practices for Connecting with Plant Spirits. Jen explains how we all owe our lives to plants, how building relationship with plants can open us to a world of awe, wonder, and magic, the importance of embracing nature's guidance over human intelligence, and how plants can teach us that the sacred exists in all aspects of life. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Jen Fry is a healer and mentor with more than 20 years of experience with plant essences, energy work, and herbal practices. The founder of Bridget's Way and co-steward of Heart Spring Sanctuary, she has dedicated her life to the spiritual path of plant work. She joins me today to discuss her book, Communicating with Plants, Heart-Based Practices for Connecting with Plant Spirits. Jen, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much, Nick. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm happy that you're joining me today. Um, uh, I love the message in your book. Uh, I really enjoyed the book, and I think there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, and I'm a little bit curious about some of your process, but there are several questions that immediately come to mind, but I thought that maybe the place to begin is your relationship to plants. You begin the book with a very simple statement. I owe my life to plants. Mm -hmm. And I think to some extent we all do, but you go beyond this. So I was wondering if you could share your journey with the plant spirits. Sure. So yeah, I do owe my life to plants. And I would say that, yes, we all do, because of course we couldn't be alive and we didn't have the, you know, oxygen from our incredible green friends or the shelter or the food or any of that. But the other reason why I say I owe my life to the plants is because they've given me this life that I lead. I mean, like, yes, of course I, I have a healing practice that I incorporate the plants in there. I teach people how to communicate with plants. I, you know, they're part of my everyday work, but also in the most challenging moments of my life, it is the plants that have brought me back from the depths of either despair or grief or just heartbreak and, and have shown me all the beauty that there is and show me the possibilities and where to go next. And so I really do feel that my, I mean, honestly, I have tears coming behind my, <laughs> I, I can feel them behind the surface here that, and I'm staring at this gorgeous or sorry, sweet gum tree. And so, yeah, they, they, my, I owe them all of my life. I try to set my every day to be in service to them because they offer so much to us. And that's usually the question that I take before we talked, I have a labyrinth here and I walked the labyrinth and it was just like, let me be the voice for you. What can what can I bring forward? How can I be in service to you? And that is the question that's the guiding force of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful, very beautiful. It seems though that there is a cultural idea and you probably get this from some people. They're like, 
you're talking to plants and it's more than just talking to plants because there's communication. It's two ways, right? Mm -hmm. How does that work? (laughs) (laughs) Jeez, Nick. Um, (laughs) So, well, first I have to say, yes, like I'm so, you know, actually I taught a plant communication workshop a little, a couple months ago and the plant that the person this one student wanted to communicate with was right outside their door. And they're like, you know what? I can't do this. Like everybody's going to stare at me. And so I gave them a pass because it was an intro course, but I'm like, for my everyday students or for my like longtime students, no, we have to do this out in public. And, and yes, some people are going to think you're crazy. Most people don't even notice it and just pass you by, but I'm so used to everybody thinking that I'm crazy, that it just doesn't even phase me. And it kind of surprises me every once in a while when people are like, wait, what do you mean you communicate with plants? So, you know, plants, all of nature, they're all intelligent beings. Like it's not just humans. We are not the only intelligent beings. And so, yes, the the very short, I guess, way of talking about the process is I always start with being in my heart. Mm-hmm. We have to start in our heart space. And that is the basis for all good communication, whether it's with a human or, you know, plant or a dog or water or whoever it is you want to communicate with. When we're in our heart space, it allows us to be more receptive, more open. Um, It allows better communication. So, you know, we see it. I'd like to bring this back to human relations as much as possible, but we see it when we have those um, conversations with people and we're just not getting one another. It's like, I'm speaking, you're speaking, and we are not meeting and we get so frustrated by it. Whereas if we could drop into our heart space, those are the conversations where you just feel so alive and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, this, this is the meaning of life because we're there, we're connected, we can feel it. We feel the connection between one another. And that's what happens when we connect, when we communicate with plants, we wanna be in our heart space because then the plants are able to tune themselves to us. Mm-hmm. And it is very much a two-way uh, communication. you know. So like sometimes it's verbal from me, that I'm speaking to them. Most people think when I talk about plant communication, that it's like the Moses and the burning bush, you know, that they're (laughs) yelling things. And so when, when they're starting to think about communicating with plants, they're like, but I'm not hearing anything. Mm -hmm. And what I say is, you know, it's absolutely okay. Like we all communicate in our own ways. And so part of what we're doing in this process is learning how it is that we receive the information from the plants. Mm -hmm. And so for me, sometimes it is, I hear them, um, internally, like your own, you know, your own self thoughts, only it's always in a different syntax or a different tone than what I use, or it's information that I'm like, whoa, that's, that's interesting. Other times I feel it in my body. And, and then other times I get images, or I like to do a lot of communication through journey work. So I also get a lot of information that way. I don't know if that answers your question enough, Nick, or if you have more. Yeah, it does. I think that I like the idea of creating relationship or building Mm -hmm. relationship with the plants, Mm -hmm. because it seems that for plant communication to work, it takes time. You can't, Mm -hmm. I don't know that you can just go and, well, I suppose you could just go to a plant and say, Hey, (laughs) how are you doing today? But that it takes some time. And it's not just how we perhaps think about communication, but it incorporates, like you said, you know, heart, but also basic observation, you know, mm-hmm. that we can learn from plants that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the relationship is the key part. And yes, it's the same thing. Like, again, going back to humans, you know, we don't go up to a person and be like, Hey, tell me your entire life story. Right. And actually I do have some friends that kind of do that, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you of course aren't going to spill all of your life story because there's so much, and there's probably a lot in your life story that you're not even aware of. Yeah. So for the plants, we, they meet us where we are. So whatever's most pressing in my life right now, whatever I need help with or what I can understand, that's the information that they're most likely to give us at that time. So we can continue to communicate with the same plant our entire life and still continue to be learning from them. Like I was just thinking about dandelion, like I'm still learning from dandelion. You know, I have a chapter about them in my book. Mm -hmm. They're one of the first plants that I work with, but I'm still, they still bring me literally bring me to my knees and like amaze me with the information. And so it's the more, the more we can develop this relationship with a plant, the deeper we can go. And so it's one of the things I think I say this in my book, I definitely tell my students this, like, 
often, I think it's a very American thing where we think we have to, it has to be lots, right? We have to be able to communicate with all the plants. We have to know 400 and some plants to like be a good healer or whatever it is that you want to do. But when we're doing this work, really a handful of plants is all that we need. Like, yeah. and it's more just like with a human, the more time we spend with this plant, the more that gets revealed and the more that, that we're able to heal ourselves really. And so, so it is at the very core, it is about relationship and relationship building. And they're just, they're just wanting me to say this at the foundation of that is also humility. Yeah. And it's recognizing again, that humans aren't the most intelligent. We're not the supreme mm -hmm. intelligence. We're not the only intelligence. Plants have a very different intelligence and and they re know who they are they you know whereas we tend to be amnesiacs so they can help us remember who we are so i think that's like the foundation there is humility heart-based humility yeah yeah and i actually had that written down and this refers to some of the things that you were just saying you tell a story in the book i think you were writing about the eastern hemlock I think that's what it was. You were telling the story. I think it was your partner or husband that was cutting down a tree mm -hmm. and the tree wouldn't fall, right? Mm -hmm. And then you ended up speaking to the other trees. But you noted there when you were telling the story that we have this tendency to choose human intelligence over nature's guidance. And, mm -hmm. and I absolutely loved that. And I thought that is absolutely right. And that is so important and that connects to that notion of humility yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's you know so it is my partner and yeah. we're we're together for four years so it's still a fairly new relationship yeah. and he doesn't he loves my work he does lots of classes with me but it's still not his skill set mm. he's very head-based and very intelligent and so and he has his own way of working with the land that when he came here, it was just like, oh, we're going to have to change this a little bit. So yeah, in, in this story, the plants, the nature spirits of this land had shown me a tree that we could cut down. And I thought it was a pine tree just because it was for a blueberry bed. So I was thinking, oh, acidic, that makes sense. Later on, we discovered it was an Eastern hemlock. And as my partner went, because he would have been the one that was cutting it down. So as he went to go, you know, survey, he's just like, yeah, I looked and there's, there's another tree that I think that's a dead standing tree that I think is in a better spot. And that would be easier for us. And it makes sense because that other one's going to create more habitat. Whereas the tree he pointed out was along the road. The other one was um, buried in a section by the, by our neighbor's property. And so I went along with it and I didn't even think about it. Like, I think that's the thing is that mm. I've been doing this work for a really long time. I've been, you know, communicating with the plants and letting nature guide the work that I do on the land here for, for like guiding the land work for well over 10 years, probably like 15, maybe even longer. And, and yet I still get knocked over by that human intelligence. Mm. And, and so I thought he had a really valid reason and it was like, okay, go ahead. But I never took it back to the plants or the nature spirits. And so, yeah, it was a really bizarre experience where he kept trying to cut down this tree and it wouldn't, it wouldn't fall until the point that he finally did get it to fall and it fell standing completely straight up. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole time I was like connecting and communicating because part of our work here is that he also needs to learn how to communicate himself and follow his own guidance. So I've just been, was waiting and watching and seeing like, do I need to intervene? And at that point I did intervene. And yeah, that's when they said like, we didn't, this is not the tree that we gave you permission for. And in the end, had I taken the information that he had and taken it back to the nature spirits and been like, hey, look, we're actually thinking this tree would be a better choice for us. Mm. Is that okay? We most likely would have gotten permission and all would have been okay. But because we didn't do that, we just went with our thinking and not notifying anybody else. It just, I mean, in the whole big scheme of things, it was very low drama, but it still was drama and it was still a lesson. And I think it was a good lesson for us to remember that we we also need to remember our humility. We always yeah. go back to that and nature intelligence. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, there's, a couple of other things that I wanted to ask in regards to this. And 
maybe we can go with the plant spirits themselves and what you mean by, by that, because you write in the book that when some people believe that whenever we work with plants, this is a direct quote, we automatically are working with the spirit of the plant, which is not true. Working with plant spirits is about relationship. And I was curious if you could maybe explain that difference a little bit more. Sure. So first of all, a plant spirit is, you know, there's intelligent life force in all beings. So that's what we mean by the plant spirit. So the plant spirit of hemlock, Eastern hemlock um, is very different than the plant spirit of mugwort. And so often I made a point in that because, you know, I started this journey as an herbalist and I would hear what, after I started working more with plant spirits, I would hear herbalists say to me, well, just be, you know, like they're making tea. So clearly I'm working with the plant spirit and it's like, no, you're working with the physical properties of the plant. You're not asking the plant spirit in the harvesting of this. You're not asking the plant spirit in the making of the medicine and it shifts things. So, you know, I also make essences. And so when I make my essences, I call them spirit essences because I'm working with the plant spirit. So yes, we can work with all of the physical components, but if we're not intentionally engaging with the spirit of the plant, which means asking them to partake in the making of this medicine or whatever it is that we're creating, then they're not included. So it has to be intentional. And yes, again, it has to be in a relationship. And in that relationship also means, you know, at the foundation is that it's consensual so that they are agreeing to be part of this and often guiding it like that's the ideal is that they're guiding the medicine making or whatever process i mean i'm focusing on medicine making because that's where right. i think working with the plant spirit is the most important aspect of it mm -hmm. but we can work with plant spirits at any time and and to that point when we have the relationship with the plant spirit we can work with them without the physical plant nearby mm. so you know, anywhere in the world, we can connect in with our, like one of my big guides who I don't have a chapter on them, but they are actually one of my most important guides is Ash. And so I can be working anywhere. And when I just need that extra support, I can call on the spirit of Ash to just, you know, really help me. Or if I'm frazzled, I would call on white pine to come in and help me calm or mugwort to help clear my energy. And I don't have to have the physical components of the plants right. anywhere. Right. Yeah, that reminds me of, and you don't actually really write about this in the book, but it reminds me of what I've heard some shamans talk about in regards to like ayahuasca, mm -hmm. uh, that there's the spirit, you know, they call it mother ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And I've been told that as soon as you make the intention to work with the plant, mm -hmm. that the spirit of the plant will start working with you right then and there. And so it's not just the drinking of the, you know, the, the, the brew, but mm -hmm. it's working with the spirit. And so I think that that's kind of what you're saying here. And likewise, they're like, but, and then afterwards, after you've invited, you know, mother ayahuasca in, you know, she stays with you after the fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true for all plants. I mean, so it happens, mm -hmm. you know, again, I have a healing practice where right. I work with plant spirits. So some of my more in tuned clients, they know that if they're needing work, sometimes all they have to do is make an appointment and we don't even have to meet. It's like, oh yeah, everything's already taken care of. Because as soon as you set that intention, or sometimes we'll do like, we'll do weekend long initiations with a particular plant. As soon as you set the intention that you want help or you want to work with a particular plant, they start working and it's just really incredible. And, you know, plants do work outside of time and space because they, they're in a different realm than humans. They don't have all the same constraints that we do. So sometimes our conscious mind wants to like question it or like doubt it, but it's really powerful and it's really wonderful how they can help us when, um, right. Just at the first question without us even ingesting anything or, or doing anything. Right. Yeah. And it's not just about ingesting the plants because mm -hmm. some of these, like you write about the poisonous hemlock, you certainly don't want to be drinking that no. <laughs> or ingesting that in any way. What was the first plant that you developed a relationship with? Well, that's actually a hard question, even though I kind of talk about it in the book. So in the book, I, I say mulberry and I credit mulberry as far as really guiding me into plant communication. And I do think that's true. But as far as the first plant that I had a relationship with, you know, that goes back to childhood. Yeah, so yeah. 
with my mom, my mom taught us about aloe. Like I remember I was less than two years old and I knew to heal with aloe and it was mm. really special to me. And my grandparents was parsley, but also corn, you know, like they, and blueberries, like they, my grandparents grew their own food. So it was really special to go and harvest them. But as an adult, and as far as like realizing that I was able to communicate with plants, it was Mulberry who um, really opened the doorway for me. Mm, wonderful. Yeah. I would think for me, it would be dandelion. I remember mm. the dandelions. Uh, I often think of dandelions as a, ch a child's plant. Oh, so totally. Yeah. 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 And honeysuckle, I just smelled honeysuckle, you yeah. know, driving down the road. And I remember being a kid and like, that was like greatest part of the day was there was honeysuckle bushes on our playground and we'd go and like harvest the nectar. And it just felt, felt like we were communing with the fairies. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a magic to plants. I think that we often for most of us living in this sort of Western industrialized world that we don't pay attention to. Mm -hmm. For sure. That is like one of the, yeah, it's one of my biggest things. And of late, actually, the plants have been pushing that more and more is to just talk about the magic. Because I think as you were saying about childhood, you know, we, as children, we, we accept magic and it's just mm -hmm. part of their daily life. Right. And it's like, but then at some point, most of us have to so-called grow up, you know, and yeah. it's just like, oh, that's just child's play. And we forget all of that. And so we get really serious. And so the plants for years just constantly are at me being like, you're too serious. You got to lighten <laughs> up. I mean, that's yeah. like probably the number one lesson I get from them again and again. And it's, they're totally true, but it is like, it's one of my, the things that I'm trying to bring forward in my work now of, and I mean, like just in the last few months, it's just re engaging with that magic again, mm -hmm. and just really reminding us because you know, for most of us, we think magic is like the realm of Harry Potter and it's make believe right. and, and we want it. We want it so badly, but magic is the dew on the grass in the morning. It's, you know, it's like the photosynthesis of the plants. It's, it's our bodies, like our bodies are such incredible beings. And so the plants just really help us to go into that world. And, and part of that is because we need wonder. And so it's mm -hmm. when we have yeah. wonder and awe that opens the door to, to the world of magic and the world of plants in my case, but the plants are such great gatekeepers at that and just encouraging us and making us, because it doesn't take long when you mentioned earlier about observation, it really doesn't take long to be observing a plant before you're like, whoa, that's like, <laughs> what they do this or look at that. And then, you know, it's just like, it just initiates that wonder. Yeah. Yeah. And as you were speaking, the word that was in my consciousness was awe, the sense of mm -hmm. awe. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I totally see the value and the importance of all of this. I, you know, I'm going to be moving, you know, I'm going to be moving and what there are several reasons why it's a little heartbreaking for me, but one is over the past, probably about 12 years now, I've developed a relationship with a piece of land. It's a canyon. And I try to go every week, every Friday, I call it my Friday office. And it's just been amazing to develop that connection and to observe, you know, the, the everything about it. And there is one tree in particular um, mm -hmm. that I've developed a relationship with. And, you know, we've had these massive storms here and part of the trail has been wiped out. Mm -hmm. So it's a real journey to try to get back there. Mm -hmm. And when I finally got back to the tree, I just started sobbing because it was like, I haven't seen my friend for so long, mm -hmm. but it's amazing how it makes me feel more human and more alive, I think, to develop these relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably such a profound statement right there. It makes me feel more human and alive to have these relationships with nature. And, and that's because... That is, that is how, who we're supposed to be, right? Yeah. It's like, we're supposed to remember that these are all of our relatives. And, yeah. and it's just the same as when we have, again, those human relationships, when we have the relationships with other humans that are just so meaningful to us, mm -hmm. that adds such beauty to our lives. And so what the, I mean, again, I'm working with the plants, but it's all of nature wants us to do is to come back into this deep relationship where there's no separation, where we see them as kin, where we see them as guides and friends and lovers even. 
Yeah. And, and it, that is what helps us remember who we are and be in life. I think so much of the depression that affects our society is because we've been so cut off from, from nature, from one another. And it's, again, it goes back to relationship and we're missing all of that. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's great. And I just want to offer, I'm going to go a little tangent here just because yeah. you're going away. So I just want to offer that. I know, first of all, I know that heartbreak. Like when I, when I was divorced, I had, I actually stayed in my marriage longer than I should have. Cause I didn't want to leave my land, my farm. And it was, it took me many, many, many years. But the thing is, is when you're moving, you're able to take those relationships with you and you can reconnect with the tree. You can reconnect with the energy of the Canyon anywhere that you are. It's yeah. of course not the same as like, just, you know, I don't know what the tree is, but often for me with trees, I just kind of melt into them, you know, yeah, yeah. not the same as really feeling their physical form, but, but know that you're not losing that relationship. That relationship yeah. can continue and can continue to deepen, even though yeah. you're not there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. It'll be interesting because there's definitely a, I don't know how I want to word this, but Southern California definitely has its plant life. Mm -hmm. And I'll be going back to Colorado, which has its plant life, mm -hmm. which is very different than mm -hmm. California. And so I'm looking forward to re-engaging with the land in Colorado. I mm -hmm. always consider Colorado home, but yeah, I'm going to miss my Canyon. I'm going to miss mm -hmm. the trees. I'm just going to miss all the plants I see as I walk in my neighborhood. Right. So it's nice to know that I'll be able to connect with that when I want to. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, we were talking about the sense of awe. And in the bio that I read at the beginning, part of this was that, you know, you've dedicated your life to the spiritual path of plant work. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you to maybe speak to that a little bit more about this plant work as a spiritual path. Gosh, that's actually a really hard question. <laughs> Uh, partly because, you know, I really, of late, I've really realized like how challenging it is to bring these other experiences into the language, get alone the English language that doesn't recognize it. So, so I think it, I'm just going to have to go back to the beginning when I said about how the plants are like every day, I'm just trying to be of service to them mm -hmm. and how, how can I do that best? And that is like, so you mentioned, you mentioned ayahuasca and, you know, I have worked with the spirit of ayahuasca, my experience, my teacher, we work totally different than what you normally hear, um, which is why I didn't write so much about her. Right. In the, and so I've had, but when my, my experience with ayahuasca was just like, oh, this is nothing compared to my everyday reality. Like mm -hmm. my everyday reality, most people would say it's insanity, but it's just like, you know, the plants just give me so much and I see things and I hear things and it guides my work. And so what I notice for myself is when I'm, when I'm not feeling human, when I'm not feeling like myself, when I'm stressed out, it's always because I'm not spending the time in nature that I need to spend. And again, it astonishes me that after all these years, I still have to learn this lesson and I have to be reminded. Even sometimes my partner would be like, have you spent enough time outside lately? <laughs> like, oh, am I like getting really crabby? <laughs> so, so I think that's part of what I mean by my spiritual path, but it's just really, it's, I just want to be in service of them and I want to be yeah. in deep relationship. I want my life to be no separation between me and the plants and me and nature. And so I keep talking about plants because I think they are the doorway and that is the basis of the book. But really I work with the intelligence of all of nature, including the unseen worlds. And so it's just, I, that's just what it is. I just want yeah. to remember. I want yeah. to remember that relationship, that connection. And I want to help others remember that mm -hmm. as well, because I think that's the only way we can have a thriving future is for us yeah. to back into relationship with nature. Yeah. Yeah. I've been reflecting on a lot of the people I've been speaking with on the podcast and this idea of remembering mm -hmm. seems to be a common denominator. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you even noted, you know, in the book and in this conversation that we are in amnesia, uh, right. we, we've forgotten who we are. And, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that the spiritual aspect is precisely in that connection. And, you know, you even noted this, 
the the wording you know communication is connected to communion and mm -hmm. common union mm -hmm. um and it's like yeah right there's your spiritual <laughs> aspect to it right, right. Um, mm -hmm. and and it's connecting us to something that's bigger than ourselves mm -hmm. for sure yeah. yeah yeah and and wondrous i think and i yeah, yeah, we need to remember who we are. Let's talk a little bit about some of the specific plants. We're not going to go into all of them, of course. Why don't we talk about dandelion for a few moments? And I, I love this because, and I took these, I think these may be the key words that you put into the chapters, but with dandelion resiliency. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so spot on because we humans were constantly trying to get rid of dandelion and dandelion just isn't going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's true about dandelion. I think it's true about other plants as well, but dandelion's like the poster child for that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it just makes me laugh often at like, well, it depends on the day I can laugh or I can weep really mm -hmm. at the absurdity of humans and like how here's this incredible plant being that offers so much to us. And if we would only take the time to just sit and listen and pay attention, we might find the answers to you know all of life's problems just there. And yet we discount this. And you know, at best we might be like, oh, this is a great, incredible edible. And so like let's or medicinal, like let's harvest. And but you know, generally, I actually was thinking about this. This goes back like 20 years. I used to live in town actually. And my, I was going for a walk with my neighbor and she just pointed out, she's like, you know, your lands, your yard is really full of dandelions. And I was like, yeah, I know. Isn't it gorgeous? Because ours was the only yard in this whole block that had dandelions. And it wasn't just a little bit. I mean, it was like a carpet of dandelions in there, but just me saying it wasn't it beautiful. She was so taken aback. She's like, oh, mm. dandelions are beautiful. And, and it just is like, I think, as I'm speaking those words, I'm just going back to like all the cultural conditioning about what is beauty mm -hmm. and, and how limited we are by what we consider to be beautiful. And yet again, here's this incredibly precious gift right outside our doors. Even if you're in a city, you know, they're growing up out of the mm -hmm. macadam and the sidewalk. I mean, talk about resiliency and tenacity and, and we just ignore them. And, but yeah, that, that is the, one of the beauties of dandelion is just this ability of resiliency. And again, yes, there's messages and there's lessons there, but also dandelion, you know, is such good liver medicine. So it just really helps us to clear away toxins and including from the earth. Right. And from so here we are spreading toxins to get rid of this plant who cleans up the toxins. And it's just yeah. like, what? <laughs> gosh insanity yeah. please but but yeah it's just here's this answer to so many of our issues right there yeah. and it's too simple you know it yeah. has to be it has to be expensive it has to be flashy it has to be complicated for us to really want to recognize it in our capitalistic society but dandelion still keeps there and and the plants i mean i said earlier you know it's not just dandelion it's lots of the plants but they're all just there they just keep showing up waiting and hoping that one day we're going to remember and we're gonna like wake up yeah yeah when i think that dandelion also is our relationship to dandelion is so emblematic of the human desire to control nature oh, know, totally. to get rid of it with all those poisons Right. Right. With all those poisons. But like you said, it's medicinal, it's edible. And it, it, you know, it seems like there's the relationship that we need to start, you know, looking at it. You know, one of the things I learned when I was in a doc, my doctoral program is there really is no such thing as a weed. Mm -hmm. A weed is just a misplaced plant, mm -hmm. you know, and we tend to think of dandelions as weeds, but they're right. not. Right. Yeah, even so, <laughs> we had our kids over last weekend, and there, my our son in law was at the garden, and he was looking, and he's like, "Oh, you have dandelions still in here," and it's like, and so my partner was just like, "Oh no, don't say anything about that." <laughs> <laughs> now I do clear some of them out of my garden. I'll be honest; I always ask permission, and because I have had dandelions take over, but I keep them there partly because 
they're they're being they're helping the garden you know they help mm -hmm. to bring in etheric forces there the roots help to bring up minerals from the soil mm -hmm. so our so-called weeds not only are they really healthy for us and and you know really great medicine for us food wise and as also like of course we can communicate with them and learn even more but they also do have a role and that's the something that i think even organic gardeners forget it's that these plants they're all here. They all have a role. So, you know, I talk in my book about invasives and it's the same thing. It's like, rather than wanting to wipe them out, like we have, now this isn't a plant, but we have the spotted lantern fly has come in this area a few years ago. And I hear people squealing in delight at like the natural food store because they just killed a spotted lantern fly. They think they're saving all of the earth by, you know, just trying to wipe out these insects or you know, again, with garlic mustard on our favorite trail, there's like piles of garlic mustard and people think they're saving the planet by pulling this out. And my question is always like, well, why? Why is this plant here? And they they move in for reasons. They have a role. And so part of what we can do if we, if we want to take the time and communicate is find out what that role is. If, mm. You know, if we're concerned that they're going to wipe out all of our native plants, well, okay, but then find out why they are here. And then how can we fulfill that role that they don't need to just proliferate. Right. Yeah. And it also seems like they could serve as a warning. I know that one of the signs of a changing climate is you get species going into areas that they had never thrived in before. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things that drives me crazy with, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm hoping there aren't going to be people like writing hate mail about this. I love native plants. I plant a lot of native plants, but I don't only plant native plants because right. I ask the nature spirits here, what are the plants that are necessary for to support the energy? And so mm -hmm. sometimes they're not native. Sometimes there are others. Now I'm not going to plant bamboo here. If the nature right. spirits say that, it'd be like, okay, we got to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Maybe we plant bamboo in a pot, <laughs> like, you right, know, like, right. but but yes, that you know, it's like our environments are changing, and it's not once upon a time we could say like, oh, climate change is over a very long time period, and and nature can evolve. But that's not the case anymore. It's happening so fast. I mean, in our own lives, you know, it's we can see it even even since I've had children, the climate has drastically changed since then. And so I agree, it it is kind of a warning. It's also a sign, and also, you know, oftentimes plants will show up in areas like for for diseases that they're the remedy for before that disease actually shows up. So like Japanese knotweed for one is a big ally for Lyme disease, recovering from Lyme disease. And Japanese knotweed will tend to show up in an area before Lyme disease proliferates. So, you know, it's also like they're showing up to give us support um, in all ways. It's not, it doesn't always have to be about humans. You know, sometimes right, it right. is about, often it is about the land, but yeah, I think we just miss so much when we just want to ignore or consider something bad rather than like, let's get curious and find out what's the role here. Why are you here? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I love the, that it shows up before the disease does. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that, that's amazing because there is an intelligence to, mm -hmm. to, to nature and to plants and yeah, we need to overcome this idea that there isn't any that ours, you know, we've already talked about this, that human intelligence is, is better somehow. And yeah. And again, I always think of dandelion with children, you know, I used to pluck them for my mother on my way home from school and for my grandmother. And I was also thinking about, you know, when you see the little puffs, you know, you make a wish and that's how they spread about, <laughs> you know, and kind of propagate. You also mentioned here, and I, in the chapter on dandelion plant dieting, mm -hmm. and I thought that maybe we could touch on that for a moment because I'm a little bit familiar with plant diets and what does that mean? Maybe start with that. What is a plant diet? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important because there's, it's again, one of those terms that there are so many different meanings behind it. And depending on how you use it, like people just think this is what you mean, but it's not. So the way in which I'm referring to plant dieting is that we're ingesting the plants in many different forms. So we work with any plant, obviously not poison hemlock. You know, we right, don't right, want right. it's going to poison us. We can work with their essence instead, mm -hmm. or, you know, work with the energy of the plant, but we're not going to make tea out of them. Right. So for the purpose of this book, what we're doing is, so I don't think we even said this, but I have activities for each chapter of ways in which you can engage in communicating with plants. And so plant dieting is one of those. And so 
let's use dandelion. So if we're going to diet dandelion, we can do this all in one day. We can do it over weeks, but you want to try different preparations. So you try a tea with dandelion blossoms and see how that affects you. What, what you've noticed, what you sense, what you feel. If you're doing it over time, how that's affected you, like maybe a couple hours later, or what your day was like compared to normal. Then we might try dandelion root tea or dandelion leaf tea or, you know, dandelion's great because we can eat all parts of dandelion. And there's so many different ways. So we could have a salad with dandelion leaves. We can roast the roots. We can drink dandelion wine. We can have a tincture of the roots or, of course, dandelion flower essence. So we just want to try as many preparations as we can from ideally different aspects of the plant and see what information we receive from each of them. How does our body feel when we ingest this? What are, you know, what thoughts, what images come to mind? What memories come to mind? What is our body doing? And, and just recording all of it, just noticing all of it. And then, you know, the point of the book is to have, this is one activity, even though there's multiple aspects to it, but is to have multiple activities so that at the very end, we can compile all that information and start putting together a story about what this plant, what are the lessons that the plants are giving us. Right, right. And that's one of the themes that runs through the book as well, is that we need a new story. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. And I think we're speaking it, you know, so when we talk about being in relationship with nature, that is the new story. And when we talk about that humans aren't the supreme intelligent beings or the, the beings in charge of control of all of earth, that's also part of that story. You know, it's, it's about coming back into alignment with nature, being part one aspect of nature and working together with all of nature to create the world. And, and in that is also remembering ourselves and remembering our full potential because we, we don't even recognize it again. You know, when I mentioned earlier about beauty, like that's only one aspect that's been culturated into us. So, so many things we've been cultured that we're not this, or we are this, or that we don't even really know who we are. And, but again, working with the plants, it's one way that they help us to see our wholeness and and who we truly are and that's part of that new story is like is working together including with one another you know that it is together that we thrive it's there's this competition this hierarchy stuff it all has to get yeah. tossed out it doesn't work and right. and we're going to end up destroying ourselves if we continue down that road yeah yeah and yeah we're doing a pretty good job of that right now i think right, <laughs> right. case in point i don't need to give any evidence of that yeah <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because I wanted to ask you, one of the plants that you talk about is corn mm -hmm. and you noted in one section about how, you know, there's a uh, traditional indigenous use of corn and it's, you know, the corn mother, the corn goddess. Uh, but yet we have in Western industrialized agriculture, at least, you know, corn's one of our crops, but we turn it into high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. And you noted that this is contributing to health issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, uh, and you noted also that corn does not want to be a poison. And, and I love that. And I just wanted to interject because I, I would like you to comment on this, but something that came to mind was I had a friend many, many, many years ago who observed that another sacred plant tobacco, mm -hmm. she's like, this is all karma. Mm -hmm. The, you know, all the addiction and the death mm -hmm. with tobacco, this all totally makes sense because we have desacralized what was once sacred. Yeah. Yeah. I think tobacco is a really clear depiction of that, but we can see it in many of the plants. I mean, yeah. it's one of the horrors I feel about GMOs, like, you know, some people want to argue about it, that there's a it's the solution for the future, but I just, I just go back to the plants again. It's like, is this what they want? Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard a plant say it is, I could be wrong. I'm only one person, but I do grow up, I, you know, where I live, it's Lancaster County. We're a farming community. So we have cornfields on either side of the road from us. And also all down the road I drive and it's just cornfields. Sometimes for miles, it's cornfields, not so much like Iowa, but you know, our, yeah. we, our farms are smaller, 
but it's still lots and lots of cornfields, which was not the case when I was growing up. We didn't, because this is field corn or feed corn. It's not uh, sweet corn. So when I was growing up, we had some sweet corn farms, but we didn't have the feed corn so much. We had tobacco, but then when, when the economy changed, it changed to that. And so I think I talk about this in the book, but when I look at the fields, I'm just remembering that like, you know, the, so both corn and tobacco are, are two of the most sacred plants in indigenous societies and all plants were always grown with prayer, with song. It's, you know, they are part of your body, the corn that I grow. I tell the story, I'm not going to get into it, but I tell the story of the Tutsil lions that, that this corn originates from where they, they are corn people. There's no separation between the corn and them. They are the same being. And and yet when I look at these farms, it's giant tractor trailers that are planting that corn. And then they spray like just horrible poisons to kill off anything else around because we've been able to modify the corn to handle Roundup and, you know, and all these poisons. And then it's again harvested by um, huge machines, like again, huge tractor trailers drive over this land constantly for harvesting. So it's very possible that these corn seeds never even touch a human's hand, yet alone receive the prayers or the songs. And I think, you know, what are we, what are we doing to them? And so sometimes when I drive the, along, I just imagine that these were planted with prayers and that this field is just a prayer filled field. And like, how does that change the energy? And it's just, um, I think it just brings us back into ourselves. It again, brings us into relationship, but it also brings us into who we are and our heart. And I talk about being a sacred human. And I think that's what it is. It's like recognizing that the sacred exists in all aspects of life. And every act that we have can be an act of honoring the spirit or the sacred or the divine or whatever you want to call it, that the supreme not supreme being i don't like that but like the the all that is Mm. and yeah i i think i think you're right that for sure addiction but so many of our problems are because we have forgotten that and we don't recognize the sacred act that it is of growing plants of working with nature of living Yeah. yeah yeah it seems like and you don't really address this in the book but just based on what you were just saying it seems like we need to get away from our modern agricultural models and go back to a different kind of farming a different kind of raising plants yeah for sure and i don't know that go back to is even the right words like mm-hmm. i i just have big question marks i don't know what it is i I take a lot. I really love Leah Penniman and Farming While Black. I think her book is incredible. And also I really appreciate Mary Reynolds, who Garden Awakening is one of her books. She has another one out more recently. And and Steiner, I take a lot of information from Rudolf Steiner, but I really feel like we we always think if we're not going to do the modern way, we have to go back. And I don't think that's true because we're always evolving. So it's really like, what is this next evolution for us? All I know is that driving tractor trailers and spreading poisons doesn't work. You know, it doesn't. And also the monoculture, it doesn't work. That's not how anything is grown. I mean, we can, it can grow in big patches. We see it, you know, but, but I think we need to go back and take our guidance from nature and see what do the plants want for growing and, and bringing again, that spirit, that humility. in. I mean, I mentioned Leah Penniman because she talks a lot about the, indigenous wisdom of of africans and just the way in which they grow their food you know the the health of a good a good farmer increases the soil and so they can measure this the depth of the soil the, the how much that person has in has improved the land because they can see the layers of soil between different farmers and i just think that's so different compared to these farms that are around me where there's no topsoil left on them right. i watched water come off of them and it's like a cement parking lot you know like yeah. 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 Well, it seems like what's going on with a lot of that is fear, you know, Mm -hmm. that we've embraced this industrial agricultural system because we fear running out of food for some reason, even though most of the crops that we're raising don't often go to our own, you know, we don't eat them. They're they're going to you know, the, the, the animals that we raise and into soft drinks and whatnot. And it seems like this idea of fear 
is something that has to be addressed. And I like that you noted this in the book because the, I think that the dominant theme that I got out of your book was love. Mm -hmm. And I thought you had a really great observation where you were talking about the environmental movement that so much of it is based on fear, you know, fear that what's going to happen. And it seems like you know, love is the counter to that, but it, it fear seems to be in so many things, not just in the agriculture, but or environmental movement, but also in agriculture and so many other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, really, it's the basis of our society. I mean, yeah. but that's what capitalism is, right? Capitalism yeah. is creating fear that there will never be enough, which is just, it just is. It blows my mind. Like I can't even get words out to say it because, you know, and I'll be honest, I can move into those moments of fear as well. And particularly like there's not enough, but when I go outside and I sit with the plants, they're like, have you looked around? I mean, everything we need is all right here. Like how amazing is that, that it's all here. And yet we think we have to slave away for, you know, 40, 60 hours a week yeah. for you know 50 years when it's all right here. And, but it is, you know, yes, our society is so driven by fear in so many ways. And I feel like, yes, again, I'm just going to reiterate what you said, but for sure, <laughs> love is the antidote. And, and we even just saying that out loud, it can feel like a little hippie or airy fairy or whatever. But for anybody who's really committed themselves to living a life of love, it's hard work because it's really hard when, when we, one, we're having to overcome all the conditioning about fear. Right. But when they're when we're coming up to a conflict with somebody, rather than to just it's so easy to just other them and say you're right. just wrong or you're a bad person or, you know, that farming when you talk about the farming like I have a lot of compassion for my neighbors because to to suddenly switch gears and not farm in that manner they would probably lose their land because we don't have a system set up to help support right. them in the transition. So I recognize that. But yeah, to choose love, that it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And and it's also so worth it. It's when we can do that, that's when the magic really happens. And that's when yeah. miracles occur. Yeah. Yeah. We live in a very dehumanizing system, I think, mm -hmm. in so many ways. And I really appreciate how in your work, it's this communication with plants and the develop me, developing of relationship with this can rehumanize us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So let me see here. If I had anything else I wanted to ask you, I know that I had a couple, I have a lot of quotes that I write out. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So we talked about corn. Oh, this was the question I wanted to ask. Sorry. With the information in your book, did all of this knowledge about the plants, was it all based on the communication that you received from the plants themselves? Or was there also traditional knowledge that you were able to draw on? Or did you find that what you were getting from the plants supported that traditional knowledge? Well, one, that's a hard question because I don't remember everything that's in the book. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so, so I would just say this, that, that most of it came from the plants, directly from the plants. And yes, a lot of it does support most indigenous and traditional knowledge. And there's a reason for that because indi indigenous and traditional knowledge is land-based. Yeah. And so, you know, they also are receiving information from nature. Right. So we can receive the same information by connecting in with the plants and, and the land. Um, so, you know, for sure that's there. Some of it I'm sure came from some of my teachers. Some of it came from just working with clients. And I, I like to, I don't know that like to is the right word, but I see patterns and so I would notice different things with clients and what plants show up for there. But it all, like what was offered into the book, it all was determined by the plants themselves. They gave me the, the themes that they wanted to talk about. Some of them I didn't agree with. Yeah. <laughs> not, not that I didn't agree with what they were saying, but I didn't want to write about it. Mm. <laughs> so like the classic example in there is the Black Eyed Susan chapter. Oh. I just... Uh, I did not want to write about this plant. And it was not that I don't love Black Eyed Susan. I totally do. But it was such a challenge for me. And if I had my way, I would have chosen St. John's Wort instead. Oh. Um, so 
you know, but the plants, you know, <laughs> so here's something that I never actually wanted to write a book about plant communication. When I first started this book, I was adamant I was not going to write about plant communication. I was going to share messages of the plants, but we were not going to talk about plant communication. And the book wasn't going anywhere. And I mean, that's not true. I had like four or five chapters written, but it just, it was a real struggle. And then finally I had to acquiesce and I was like, all right, you want a book about plant communication. And then it suddenly all flowed. Mm -hmm. So, so that's kind of the way things work with the plants is that they're very wise. And yeah. I often have to, you know, put my own limitations aside and follow their guidance. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just general good advice, I think, <laughs> for <laughs> uh, getting us out of this mess that we've, uh, put ourselves in. Right. And it's also, it seems that there are also messages with, again, going back to the observations by just observing the cycles of a plant's life. Cause you also note the importance of incorporating the rhythms of nature into our, into our lives. And it seems like observing plants and communicating with the plants during that could be very helpful. Do you find, this is something outside of the book, but it's connected. Do you find communicating with plants that you get different, I don't know how to say that, like a different voice or a different wisdom at different stages of a plant's life? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know that I, yeah, I don't know that I can give a definite answer to that. I mean, the one thing that I would say, and I wouldn't say like it's a different voice or anything, but the one is just, again, because I'm staring at this tree. So talking with older trees um they just have seen more and they have more to share so often there's a greater depth than when we're talking with young trees and also i don't know if this is actually a true statement but it's just what i feel is that they there's also a, a bigger willingness or maybe ability to communicate like i've planted lots of trees on the property and i always feel like when they're babies it's me communicating with them more than back. Like I'm just kind of encouraging them. Like, you know, we're so happy to have you here and please, please grow and survive. And, you know, if you need anything, let me know. And mostly they'll just tell me that they need water, yeah. but I'm not really asking of them any information. So maybe it's because I'm not asking mm -hmm. that, but I do feel like definitely the older trees give, um, they just have a depth of wisdom, just like, you know, talking with an elder, there's a depth yeah. of wisdom. Yeah. 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 No, thank you for that. I know it was a difficult question. I was just thinking also about trees and how, you know, with the cycles of change, you know, they lose their leaves. And, you know, I know that when I was younger, I hated to have to go and rake all those leaves. And I wonder if the tree might say, don't do it. Oh, just for leave sure. it because <laughs> that's a necessary part of growing more soil. And right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I was thinking about this again today. It's just like, the more we work with nature, the less work we actually have to do. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know why people have, more people haven't gotten on board with that. I think maybe at least where I live, you know, this is a very Germanic based area. And so yeah. work, it like how much work you do it really determines yeah. the view of who you are. So I think maybe yeah. it's just ingrained in us, but for sure, like we stopped raking leaves and we stopped mowing. It's one of the best things that we did for the land here. We, we mow paths and we mow certain areas. Of course, like our septic field has to be mowed, but for the most part, we just let areas go wild. Yeah. And, and it's like, it's the best thing that we can do for the land and we don't have to do the work. It's like, Oh, I just yeah. saved myself hours of work right. this weekend and I get to help the land. Yeah. Yeah. You noted this, I think in the chapter on maple, which I enjoyed, but and this is again, a direct quote. There's a common belief that life is difficult and we must work hard for anything worth having. Mm -hmm. However, maple reminds us that this is human conditioning focus on life's sweetness, just as easily on life's difficulties. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I like that. So I will often ask this question to guests who are speaking about environmental issues and plants and the nature and whatnot. So I'm going to ask you, it's been a while since I've asked this question, I think. Do you have hope? Oh, for sure. I do. Not to say that I don't have moments of despair, mm -hmm. but again, whenever I have those moments of despair, it's because I haven't been spending time in nature. Mm -hmm. So it's whenever I spend time with the trees, 
or the land you know, or water, you know, any aspect. But usually for me, it is the trees that I go to when I'm just feeling a little down. Mm -hmm. They just always remind me that that we can't even begin to imagine the possibilities that exist. And I think to me, I think that was one of the great gifts of COVID actually was that we saw how quickly nature can recover. And it's astonishing, even to me, like even to people who know that nature is able to recover and heal, it was astonishing how quickly that can happen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's true of all my experiences with the plants is that, you know, normally when we, when I talk about the plants, I talk about the long view because they have such a longer lifespan than us. And, mm -hmm. and they've been on this earth for way longer than humans have, but also plants can make things happen. Nature can make things happen in really short moments. And so whenever I go to them, I have no other option, but to be hopeful and to, to just understand that there is a better world that we can't even begin to imagine. And I try my best. That, that's my question I ask because I interview people myself. So whenever I interview, I'm always asking like, how, what is the future that you see? I want to know what people see and because I don't have a vision for it, but I have a sense. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, for sure, there's hope. I have hope. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, I like that answer. Thank you. Um, so... <laughs> One final question. I know we're starting to run out of time here, but what would you recommend for someone who would like to start trying to communicate with a plant? Um, how, how, how would someone start that? So the first thing we always do is ask for a plant and then pay attention. So, you know, in my world, we always say if a plant crosses your path three times, they're trying to get your attention. Mm -hmm. And what that means can be various things. Like sometimes you're on a hike and a plant grabs you're like oh that's a really cool plant I've not noticed this plant before and then you discover who they are and then later on you discover that they're actually growing down your street or somebody gifts you that plant um or sometimes if they're edible they'll show up in your your food or you know or on a clothing suddenly you know it's like you just start seeing the plants and it can happen in really weird ways I don't feel like you have to wait for the third time but for sure if, if you notice it three times that's an invitation and you want to take it. And so if, once you discover who, um, who that is, then we want to get into our heart. And the quickest way for that is gratitude is to just think about all the things that you're grateful for until you feel a physiological shift. And then you simply go and you spend time with that plant. And again, like my book, there's lots of activities in my classes. We have lots of activities. So there are different ways, but also sometimes it is just simply sitting and just paying attention and, and being so keenly observant. And that's like to everything. It's what's the thoughts coming through your head? How's your body feeling? If a bird suddenly sinks, like sometimes we'll think something and then a bird sings or the wind blows, that's just confirmation. So you definitely want to pay attention to that. Sometimes we'll have weird songs pop in our heads. Like, mm. you know, so at the beginning, we just note everything we don't discredit anything and we can bring discernment in later after we have more of the story but so often what i find with people who are starting to learn particularly if they have doubts that they are able to so that's number one thing that everybody is able to this is innate we are born with this gift we just have to remember it so when people have doubts when they start they'll they'll like ignore all those thoughts that came in or ignore the song and then later, this often happens in classes. So at the end of our class, they'll start to say what information they came forward. And if it's a plan, I know I'll share some more information that might help them. And they're like, oh, actually, I did get that from the plant, but I just thought that was, you know, wasn't accurate. And so that's the biggest thing is like at the beginning, we just notice everything. And so just spend time. And the worst case that's going to happen is you spend some time with the plant and, and I guarantee you're going to feel like more relaxed and more yeah. peaceful. Yeah. And um, yeah, so just give it a go. Yeah. Now, do you find that more people are kind of seeking out, you know, these kind of classes that you're offering, that they're wanting to develop a relationship with plants and the nature? Oh, for sure. Definitely. There are more people that are wanting to have an in-depth relationship with all of nature and plants. And, and it's starting it's starting to broaden out. Like when I first started this work and even for my teachers, you know, for, so, you know, going back 30 plus years, it was always plant people 
who wanted to learn plant communication, meaning like herbalist, flower essence practitioners, gardeners, like people that just really love plants. And now I'm starting to see more people from other areas. So that's one of the areas that I want to grow more and I want to work with them more. So like last year, I taught a, a three-day class to um, most, most of the people, over half the class were involved in green building. And then there were other people who were business people. Uh, there was only maybe two plant people in the whole class, which is like so unusual. You know, it's unusual to have one non-plant person in a plant, in a group. So, so that just gave me, when you talk about hope, that gave me hope. And it also showed me the possibility for the work and how important it is that we need to take this beyond plant people um, to everybody. So even if, you know, you don't want to be an herbalist, whatever field you're in, the plants can help guide you with that. And more than just your work, your life, whatever the troubles are in life, it's, it's just like, why would you not want to hear the wisdom that surrounds you? Like, why, why would you not want to know that you are supported and you are loved in every moment of your life? Yeah. Yeah. We need to start listening to our plant kin, I think. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. They will guide us. They will guide us. So uh, final questions I have for you are, what do you have coming up next? So that's a good question. I do have, I mean, I'm talking a lot about my book. Yeah. My book actually, it is available now through me and Inner Traditions, but it comes out June 13th. So that's right. exciting. And I do have some classes over the summer. I normally teach an apprenticeship program and I'm revamping it. So I'm not teaching it this year, but I have a class on energy hygiene, I think in July. And then I have another class called Through the Portal, where we're going to work with the different directions, seven directions and elements. And, and then another class, I think that's in September on working on co-creating a sanctuary. So how do we work with nature? And so all of them are include working with the plants, you know, for the energy hygiene, we'll work with St. John's word and mugwort and yarrow and some other plants. So the plants are, you know, the basis of pretty much all my work. But yeah, that's what's coming up and garden time and time with my grandson. So oh, wonderful. Where can people go to find out about the classes and to find out more about you and your work? Yeah. So the best place is my website, which is bridgetsway.com. Okay. And there's lots of information there. All right. Wonderful. I will put a link for that in the show notes right. in the video description, as well as links to your book. So, well, Jen, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I love the the wisdom that you're bringing and it's a very necessary voice you know that you're i don't want to say that you're speaking for the plants <laughs> but that you are a conduit for what the plants have to tell us perhaps well thank you nick it was a pleasure and thank you to all who listened i hope you enjoyed it yes i'm sure that they will i'm sure that they <laughs> will all right well wonderful and that's a wrap on episode 92 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience or view this on Spotify. If you like what I do here on Rebel Spirit Radio and would like to support my work, then please consider becoming a patron. You can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or video description. And of course, if you would prefer to make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. I will be incredibly grateful for any support that you can provide. Another way that you can help the podcast is to share it with friends, family, coworkers, anyone that you think that will enjoy it. And please share it on social media as well. That really is one of the best ways that you can help and support the podcast. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit, and I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help me share the good news. Also, if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to, or watching, Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit. <laughs>